Is it Willow Creek, Creek Property Association's owner? God, I can't. Okay. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> Is there a speaker? Yeah. There There's no be. speaker for that. Oh, there's for us. Oh, well, then erase what I just did. <laughs> it's okay. Well. Well, let me start over here. I'd like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone to the Crossings at Willow Creek Property Owners Association quarterly board meeting. Um, I thought um, the board should introduce themselves. I'm Lori Heatwell, um, the board president. Hi, Pete Giobanco, I'm treasurer, and I live there also. Okay. I'm JC Goodwin, I'm a property owner and a been living in the crossings about two years and a board member at large. Hi, I'm Brenda Dozier. I'm the vice president and I also live in the crossings and have about two years. I'm Janet Dow. I'm a property owner and I live right next to the crossings and I've lived there for about uh, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Bob Balzano. I'm the manager of Agent for the association. Our company, DHP Management Services, is uh, pleased to have been with the crossings for about a year now and look for a long term relationship with them. Thanks. And John, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm John Sellers. I'm uh, one of my discovery specialists. Discovery yeah. specialists. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 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 That's right. I, know you <laughs> I live in the crossings. I've been a member there for about two years and I was asked by the board to help out on some discovery items. Appreciate that. And our first item is our um, special guest speaker, Greg Toth. He's the City of Prescott drainage engineer, and he's going to give us a presentation and have some open discussion on drainage and flood issues for Willow Creek. I'll turn it over. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I so what I'll do with this. Let's see if you can clip it on. Yeah, let's see if I do that. Okay. Uh, uh, first, let me say that I appreciate John and the um, the time he's, he's spent with me. I know there's been a lot of other issues that are unrelated to what I'm here for, and um, I, I, I was warned about John. But then when I met him, I found out that his interests were, uh, with regards to my operations and what I can handle, absolutely what, what they should have been on a professional level. and so. I uh, uh, was very agreeable to come out here and, and discuss with you all what we're doing at the city. And there's a lot of things going on in Willow Creek, and and hopefully we can we can go over a number of those things. Um, on Sunday, I got a um, and to start this out, and I I'm not one of those public speakers that you know sits down and writes down all this stuff and says I'm going to talk about this and keeps things in order so if you notice that there's some digressions in, in one place because of some questions I'll try to bring it back in but you all help me as well um, but I got a, um, a letter that was sent out through Bob yeah uh, with regards to a series of questions and I thought that before I got into this stuff that I wanted to talk about that ref uh, is specific to what the city's planning to do along Willow Creek or with Willow Creek that we think is to a, an advantage to this development and hopefully will allay some of the fears and, and also my hope is to gain confidence that you all will gain confidence in what we're trying to do. Often people think the city doesn't care, they don't listen, uh, they're hiding something, all those types of things. So. Um, but just, I don't know if everybody has a copy of this. I, I imagine that you pass that out. And, um, and some of these are pretty easy to answer. Um, and, uh, and, and so let me just go over those, if that's OK with, with, with you all. Uh, and I am from Texas, by the way. I graduated from the University of Texas. So if I say y'all, <laughs> that's where it comes from, OK? Um, why did the, uh, and, and the University of Texas is a great college, by the way, in case anybody knows that. <laughs> and and I, as I, I must say that every time Texas has to play a Pac-10 team, I always seem to come out on the good side of that. And I have to go back to work and have to listen to people talk about, yeah, right, sure, yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. But I'm sure there's a lot of people here that are from other parts of the country because this is a big retirement area, and so ASU is not a, a, an absolute... Um, you know, the thing. Uh, in this first question, I thought what I'd do is just go over these just one by one. And, 
in the first question, there was a concern uh, that w w which emanated from Don Cherry's uh, review and his comments with regards to the levy. Um, and I also today received a response from uh, Scott Lyons, and I think some people here may have seen that. I don't know. Uh, you, oh, you put it in this? Okay. And, and his response was pretty much what I was going to tell you, and that is that all engineering plans, particularly when they're done for a city function, we contract with that engineer. That engineer brings those plans in at different intervals, as in when they're 30% complete. Well, first you have an, an initiation meeting, and you say this is what we're looking at, sort of a, a scoping uh, um, idea. But a lot of that is also put into what we call a statement of qualifications or request for qualifications, uh, which is where the engineers get the project they look at it, and then they decide to submit uh, a, 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 an indication of their experience and who's on staff and all that. But um, when something comes in, we look at it at different intervals. It's usually a 30, uh, 60, and then a 90% uh, level. And at each one of those levels, things change. We may change what we want. We may see that they misunderstood what their objective was or the scope of their work. And, and we will redirect them. That's part of that relationship. It's a partnership. And, and sometimes we do have engineers that come in and they go, and, and we look at it and we realize that they just didn't get it. Um, and regardless of fault, we redirect them and then they proceed. And I think that's what Scott was trying to say, that they, it's, it's a, a partnership sort of as we go forward. The end product is what's important. And the end product of that turned out to be within all codes as established by FEMA through their levy certification for that time with regards to the stability of that, that structure. So there's no concern on our part uh, as to its erodibility. Um, there, are other al there are other aspects of a levy in which it's supposed to, uh, to, to function as, and that has to do with the level of the the floodplain itself as it goes through there. And if, if we don't have, and we might come back to this later, on a levee, you have the very top, and then you have your water elevation. The distance between those two is called freeboard. And FEMA specifies a certain freeboard from the top of your levee to what your design storm, in this case the 100 year, is at, at that location. And it's three and a half feet we had problems with that, and it had nothing to do with the armoring. So I would like to allay your fears, if there are any, with regards to the armoring that was done there. It ended up being a good project with regards to that. So that, that was that one, and, and Scott speaks to it very clearly. Um, in, is the city confident the levy is, is, uh, is safe based on Lions Engineering? Um, we, are, we, feel it, we're, we feel it's safe. However, as I was saying about that freeboard issue and FEMA's requirement to certify levies, which they've always done, it's never changed. Some people will say that Katrina instigated um, a, a more stringent uh, criteria for acceptance of, of levies. Well, they didn't. What they did is they just started applying what was already on the books. They'd become a little lax even though they're not here to defend themselves. So I may, I, I retract that if, if that was not the case. But uh, that freeboard, again, from the top to the level of the water, there's a, it, it's fixed. You've got to have it where it is. Um, what we've done, and, and um, let me set this down. I talk better with my hands. Is what we've done is, is we've said, okay, this may or may not work as far as meeting uh, the certification of FEMA for the freeboard issue. We requested from uh, the Yavapai County Flood Control District $200,000 to do a more comprehensive analysis of the area um, and to, a hydraulic analysis. And hydraulic analysis is doing a floodplain study. And I'll try to not slip in hydraulic analysis and I always say floodplain study. Um, but the floodplain study has to be done. And we are concerned not with that armoring part, 
but we're concerned with the part that wraps around and then runs perpendicular to the flow of the water. The water comes this way as it comes down the creek, and that levee actually starts up above, and I don't know the street names, I haven't been here long enough, and then the levee comes down around and then runs parallel with that channel. That portion that's up on the, up on the upper part in which the water flows to is the area that I'm uh, most concerned with. So we're going to reanalyze that um, and see if it in fact does meet the certification requirements for FEMA. I also am going to request uh, as part of that money that everything behind that levee we analyze. What happens if it fails? Because it's not a typical levee that goes up 10 feet, cuts over some distance, come down, can, comes down 10 feet. It actually goes up, cuts across a little bit to the top, and then it just gradually comes down. So it's, a, it's not your typical levee um, where if you had a failure, that failure would only affect maybe the top couple feet. So we need to know more. And uh, the $200,000, I'm understanding, has been approved. And within that $200,000, we'll not only do the analysis, but we're putting money in there to do engineering design to do channel improvements. Uh, there is some inefficiency with uh, what we call deposition inside the channel. If you go bank to bank on about, it's pretty wide in there, maybe 300 feet wide. On the interior, we've had a lot of soil build up over the years. And we've had a lot of vegetation grow in that soil. Uh, and when that vegetation grows, it, it gives that soil strength and it's less erodible during storms. Um, and then that vegetation gets bigger, the roots get stronger and all that. Um, and um, we don't like that being there. We'd like to see that moved over and have a more uh, efficient cross-sectional area for the channel. Um, and if we can do that and lower that elevation there, that will translate to more efficient and lower elevations upstream. Now it doesn't continue up forever, it does dissipate as time goes on. But we, we're going to take the 200,000, we're going to do the analysis um, of the floodplain and, and how it relates to that levy. We're then going to take money for engineering design to do channel modifications and then we have money to do those channel modifications. And so that, that's going to accomplish a lot of things in that area. Uh, yes, sir. Can you show us on the map where, where you're talking about? Let's see. The levee is, of course, I'm not going to get a good picture of it. Uh, here's the levee right through here. This is Willow Creek Road, um, if I've got that right. Uh, and I think Mortimer's is right here. This levee comes like this. And see how it parallels this channel? I, I, can everybody see that? Yeah, because I think that's Lorraine Drive there, isn't it, Greg? Yeah, I'm sorry, what? I, I think I may be pointing you Lorraine Drive. This is, I think this is Lorraine Drive here. Okay, okay. <clears throat> um, and, and what you can see is this nice, narrowed passage, very efficient, coming through here. Um, levees protecting these areas over here. But then it comes across, and it comes up like this. Now, of course, I didn't bring a map showing that. The area I'm concerned with is up here. I'm really concerned with that. Can I see it? Yes. yes, absolutely. Here it is right here. Yeah, this area. So this water coming down like this and hitting this, it doesn't do that. I mean, it comes down there, but it, it's an area where we call it ineffective flow. It doesn't have any velocity, but it can, in a, in a pretty good storm and with some good wind, you can actually get surge, and it'll come over this right here. This part up here is a, is a structural, uh, as in a concrete wall, uh, levee. And then I believe that street, um, where is it? I think this street right here is built up as well. I don't know about that one down there. And this is where the apartments are, I believe. Yeah. Um, so is that green line, the outline, the one no, that's the half, uh, the um, 0 0.05%. That's a 500-year storm. Okay. Um, we tried to take it out, but it wouldn't work. The 100-year is the sort of the pink-purplish thing, and then the lighter color in here is the floodway, 
Um, but we're going to talk about why that stuff really doesn't have as much application as we'd like to see. It, it functions in today based on the best information, but we really want to change that. Um, so this levy is, it, it's, a, it's something I've, we've got to get fixed. It, it, we have to know what's going to happen. And I could go into a lot more about it and what we're doing and all the fancy software that we're looking at. And, um, but that's not, I mean, this is, I think, enough on what we're trying to do with that. But we do have money to do some channel improvements to, to create more conveyance. And that's, that's the, really the key thing here. Uh, I know that, that John has brought to my attention some idea of bringing the levy up uh, for, or continuing it up further upstream. And right now, I, I'm, I'm not in that uh, mode. I, it's something that somebody, some people say things to you, and then you'll go, yeah, it's something to look at, but I don't feel it. But that doesn't mean it won't come back in, and there may be other remediation, floodplain remediation programs that will uh, um, do the same thing you're after, but no longer have people on the other side of the, of the, uh, of the levee uh, that are subject to damage if that thing fails, but rather do channel improvements inside and then bring them down the flows. That's the best way to go in this area, in my opinion. So, okay, that was that question. That was a lot longer than I expected to. All right, let's see. All the cases are that the pipes have adequate cover. However, the nature, uh, are the city, oh, I'm sorry, are the city water pipelines and the crossings owned wash now safely covered and anchored? Yes, they are. They are. Um, but I want to explain something. What we call soft material rocks is alluvial soils. They're highly erosive and move. And being new to this area, I haven't been here two years now, one of the things I've learned is that soil movement is a, is a life cycle of all channels. And what we will see, I mean, I've been to conferences and workshops, very intense workshops, where we've done all the calculations, done design work. Uh, it wasn't a conference where I go to one place and listen to something and go to another and listen to something else and can't wait for lunch. Um, uh, and I, uh, I, I learned quite a bit from that, too, because we did not have this problem as much in Texas. Um, but but we, we're going to try um, uh, to... To monitor, it's what, and I know the terms may not sound good to you, but we have what we call degradation and aggradation. Degradation is where the scour of the channel flow line gets taken out and it moves on. At the end of the storm, it, you can see it. It looks like, well, what happened here? Two storms later, it's filled up. There's a pattern that happens where we have, and that, the degradation is the removal. The aggradation is, is the, the placement. The channel wants to operate in, 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 in an, um, uh, a, 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 an equilibrium as it moves down, and it will continue to do that throughout its lifespan. Uh, now, occasionally, they'll run into a rock formation. That won't happen there. But most of the channels, and willow is ideal in, in, that, con in that context. It is going to be subjected to movement of the, what I call the flow line is the bottom of the channel. So if I, if I say flow line instead of the bottom of the channel, it will, it will uh, erode and, and scour and erosion are the same. We tend to use erosion as a part of the embankment. We have bank erosion, scour within the channel. Um, we have in the past gone in and done um, improvements or check dams as they call them and I know that from my discussions with John that that was perceived to be an increase in the, in, in the water or the, or the channel and, and, and as a check dam and it was going to increase the flow of, a, of water upstream and thereby create higher elevations and affect the properties different from what an elevation certificate may have listed. We found an incident it was brought to my attention by John that you guys have put something in here that doesn't look right at all. I went out there, 
Sure enough, he was right. And I immediately got with the uh, utilities department and I said, that's got to go. And they took it out. And I haven't been back to do it, but I'm going to have it resurveyed again to see if, in fact, it's back to where I feel it's compatible with the historical configuration of the channel. Um, so, yes, we're going to have pipes on cover again, and yes, we're going to fix them. But, but I'm going to be involved in the next phase. There is a science of, of scour and how you go about designing something within the channel to prevent that scour from happening and also to get what we call deposition, which is just as, as water comes down and hits this thing, it gets uh, to a very low velocity and the suspended solids will actually fall out and they will create a new flow line or channel bottom. So we, we've got that and, it, and it's come about as a result of what I saw out there and, and being uh, given a field trip of all the other things that they've done and they've tried to do the right thing. They submitted it to FEMA, they submitted it to uh, uh, the Corps of Engineers, they got their permits, the remediation permits, they tried to follow that. Now what happened is it looked like they went beyond that and thought they now knew what they were doing so they were going to do something else and it, that wasn't the right way to do it. And so we're going to do that. Okay, let's see, what else? This is going much longer than I expected. Is it, do you guys want to go through all this? Or should we just talk about something else? I, you all have these, these questions. I'm taking longer than I expected. Okay. No, I want to do what you guys want. So <laughs> I do. Uh, let's see. The city, uh, let's see. All indications are the pipes have adequate cover, however, the nature of channel re So I did that. Okay. Lyons, letter of, of September 2001, talks about vegetation and blockage in Willow Creek. A cursory inspection of the creek upstream and downstream shows buildings, construction, storage, and even buildings in the floodway. How does the city plan to address this? The city will look into the available options for removal of structures in the floodplain that shouldn't be there, including consulting with the city attorney. I'm unaware of anything being in the floodway as a habitable structure, but we will follow up on it. Anytime we find that, it's out. We can't do that. It, should be in, it shouldn't be in there legally. There are some grandfathering issues. Um, because of the remaining blockage in our wash to the pipeline armoring, and now we have a huge de uh, deposit of potentially valuable crushed granite wash down from Granite Mountain, can we move this and sell it? Were you serious about that? <laughs> I had a chuckle when I read that. I thought, aren't these like million dollar homes? They're going to be out there scavenging buckets of granite. And <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a landscaping company. Yeah, believe me, if they knew it was down there, they'd have their folks running down there. To, okay. Um, what did I say? Oh, I said the pipeline armoring. Uh, should always be placed to only recapture the pipeline armoring is pla is only placed to uh, is only is is it should always be placed to uh, only capture the historic sh uh, channel flow line again the bottom any overfills or incorrect placement of material has been recontoured to reflect the historical channel configuration removal of any material without engineering plan and coordinating with city is not allowed. And really what that comes to, we've had situations where a mining operation is upstream and they knock out the balance of that aggradation, aggradation, degradation I said earlier to where we'll get scour but there's nothing to fill it in. And that becomes a big problem because they've offset nature's balance of a channel. Um, and we, I haven't had to do this but companies have had to go up and go, this permit is going, has to expire within some period of time because you're really harming the effects of this channel. You lower, everything gets lowered and we lose vegetation because the roots get exposed. It's, it's a mess. Um, let's see. Uh, the engineer documents supplied by the Hubert Servitor are 
Oh, well, I don't have to read all this one. Uh, this is a question for Craig Dotson, uh, who's our utilities operations, and I'll be glad to share that, that number with him. He really needs to answer those things. I, I'm a little familiar with it, but not enough to really answer. Uh, it's his task to do that. The next question is the same thing. Anything that has to do with utility line operations, that is not my expertise. I am a hydrologist. I deal with hydrology, hydraulics, and environmental issues. Um, I did. I sent them to him. I, I gave them to him, and I said that he may be asked to come in and explain those. Um, I, I do believe that you all are going to find that it's not a bad deal. Some, some things happen. Um, I have, uh, let's see, after the work done last week, is the city compliant with the 1948 water pipeline easement, which can call for the land to be restored to its original uh, profile? All, in, this is my answer, all indications are that the work is consistent with the flow line that existed when the 1984 FEMA flood study was completed. We are planning to have the area resurveyed as part of our program mentioned above in item two, where I talked about the $200,000 from Yavapai uh, County Flood Control District. That'll all be redone. Um, and, and just to even say that are we back to where we were uh, in 48, that's, that's not our control point. Our control point is to make sure things are covered. And you've had normal erosion, scour, removal of sediment, transport of sediment, settlement of sediment, and whether it's exactly like that, uh, it's hard to say, but it's very close. And particularly when we have developments that are around there, it's our job to monitor all those activities. Um, neighbors trespass on our wash occasionally. This is normally young people who clamor on the rocks among the watering pop li pipelines who is liable for injury due to this? Um, is it Bob? Did yes. you, you put these questions together? Uh, they were put together by uh, different people. I see. And you tell them I was a hydrologist? No, I had actually a good laugh on that when yeah. I was like, I've expanded my responsibilities now to controlling yeah. children wandering around and. It's actually a business plan. Yeah, I know. Well, not only plan on the rocks, but ATVs. Yeah. 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 Well, some of this I looked at and I thought, okay, they got somebody here from the city. We can ask them everything we want. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that was okay. I'm fine with that. Huh? We weeded them. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I, what I did is I just forwarded this to the city attorney, and then he can answer that. Because I don't know what the rules are for trespassing and property rights and common area rights and all that. Um, and then what can be done about the sewage overflow into the wash? And I, again, have forwarded that to Craig Dotseth. I would offer that because I am the city's environmental uh, control uh, operator, the, the, uh, the ADEQ operations, um, that I'm, I try to become familiar with that. I am aware that they have a very strict uh, requirement of compliance within the ADEQ operations. They have um, a, a very comprehensive clean out. Uh, they camera these things. They inspect uh, what the lines look like. They do the repairs they need to do. They do the upgrades. Um, and some pipes are very old, but they're still very functional, and they don't need to be replaced. But again, I'm going to let Craig Dotsis, Dotsis to, uh, respond to that in the time that you guys get to talk to him, because he can really go into the amount of work that they do to keep everything clean. I was brought, it was brought to my attention there was a spill. I know that one of those spills, which has happened very infrequently, was because some juveniles, we assume they're juveniles, uh, had put rocks into a manhole. That manhole plugged up, um, and then so we had some spillage from that. So that was sort of a, a third party uh, action that caused it as opposed to the failure of the system. It just, it's not intended to handle that. But in response to that, they bolted all the, the manholes so that it, it's not easily accessible. So, okay, so that's all that stuff. 
We all bored enough with that? Ready to move on to the fun stuff? Okay. Um, at, in that $200,000, I want to go back to that. It's really the focus of what I'm trying to do. Um, Willow Creek, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting waterway. And I don't know if anybody can see these, um, but I, let's see if I can try to piece together what I'm looking at. Um, let me pull this one up here. This is the upstream end. That This is upstream of, of where you live. It's up in the, um, the Jack Drive. Even, even though, is there a connection with Jack Drive? Well, I, no, I'll hold it up. I got it. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I can go right over here with this one. Um, here's the problem we've had with some of the analysis that's been done in the past. Um, when you look at a creek, you see a nice shape, well, relatively nice shape, with, with some embankments. Um, and you do a floodplain study, and the floodplain study says, hey, it all works. Everything works. Water's running through there. Um, and it does it based on certain considerations. There, there, there's a physics of, of what we're looking at. Um, and not to go into that, there's the human element of it, too. And as a hydrologist, what I have to do is say, okay, this looks good, but when we do this analysis, we're always looking from downstream up. Because you can't say that you, this water up here will flow unless you know what's going on down here. It's no different than, than traffic. Um, you, you're only limited to move and, and, and uh, get from point A to point B depending on what's out in front of you. If, if there's a crash, you're shut down. Or if it's moved to the side, then you're slowed. Um, if it's um, Sunday morning and there's no traffic, it's a light shower. Everything moves fine. If it's um, uh, rush hour, everybody's trying to get to the same place and you've got everything crowded. I don't know if that's the best analogy, but what I look at is knowing that the, 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 the traffic can't move if it's not moving downstream. That's what we look at. So in this case, we've got water that, in, and I've had some submittals that say the water's in the channel. But what I look at is what's happening upstream. And, and you all are familiar with this because you have a channel that doesn't have a, a real nice um, descending elevation to the channel. What you have is you have a main channel. This is not everywhere, so some of you may not be affected by this. You have a nice center channel, but in the overbank, it actually dips a little bit. And then you have these sort of real broad, and you may not even notice them, real kind of broad, flattened areas that are almost swales, but they're very broad. And that's what's happening. The water gets out of the bank further upstream, and it can't get back in. If the water's out here, and this, and this is the channel here, it has no way to go back in. It has to go down and find a place either where the channel curves or a tributary catches it, collects it, and takes it with it. That's the focus I'm, getting on, I'm, I'm looking at on this thing, how much water gets out of the channel. Another thing that engineers may not do is when they see the water in the channel downstream and we know that there's water in the overbank, is what I call it, well, there's not as much water in the channel. It's in the overbank. So I have to find the place to put it. Where can it go back in? By put it, I mean where is it going? I'm not doing it. And that's what you have out there. You have a very, very, very broad floodplain. There are houses that, for instance, are Ashwood would be an example. Who lives, does people live on Ashwood? Am I in the right place? Ashwood is in the, in the development, is it? Right. It is? Yes. Okay. Ashwood has that overbank area, which is going to be very scrutinized. It's going to really, we're really going to look at that. Um, and then above that, there's some more that comes out. Do I have another one back here? No, that's further down. Let's go over here. Um, it tries to get back in. 
uh, driftwood, a little affected by it. Um, and where does it get back out again? Well, it gets back out to the to the north um, on a Robin Road. Is that still in the development? Yeah. Robin Wood, Robin Wood, uh, Robin Road, I should say. Uh, and what I'm hoping to do is that if I can get more channel capacity in there. Okay. Well, I'm almost there, but yeah, yeah. Um, but that the information I was talking about, the $200,000, is the idea is to do some channel improvements in here and hopefully suck this in. Um, we may, and I'm not saying I'm going to do this now, so please don't say Greg said he's going to do this. Um, but if, we, if the elevations are right, we might come to you guys and say, hey, we got a solution, but you're going to have to help us with it because our money's limited. We have no money for easement, and we might find that there's a way to carve some lateral intercept flow uh, channels to where the water's out there, it keeps the going down there, and, and can we kind of divert it through a small channel system into the, into the creek? That's just a, a, one of those things. That when we look at these things, we may come up with 10 different ideas, Eight of them are shot out of the saddle because they make no sense at all. And two of them may have some benefit, and, and one of them may end up being done with modifications. So that's just the engineering process. Um, but I am concerned with the amount of water. It's not deep, though, just so you know. I, I'm feeling all the elevation certificates that are out there are, uh, I haven't found one that I, that's brought concern to me. They all seem to be high. Uh, up higher above by the, what is it, one foot elevation. Um, and, uh, and so I, I'm feeling comfortable with that, but I want a real good analysis. It, it's a different kind of analysis, and it hasn't been done yet. This represents the old style. In the new style, what we do is we see water come out of the floodplain, we keep it there, same amount of water. We don't let it change because the channel has a little more capacity. The old study would take some of that water and put it in there. So what we have ways of doing that. Probably more information than you guys want. But, um, the, I talked with Charlie Cave yesterday. He is confident. We've, we've gone through two readings of the Yavapai uh, uh, County Flood Control District. We've requested $510,000. We've gotten approval for that. In that, we had a little bit of money of, of the, we originally did three hundred ten. dollars some of that was in there for Willow. We asked for an additional $200,000. So I have a little bit more money to put into Willow. It may be as high as two fifty, dollars uh, if we need more money for channel improvements or, or doing things. Um, so I, I feel good about what's going on out there. I, and I feel it does deserve attention, as do other creeks. We are, by the way, doing all the other creeks. We've done, we did Granite this past year with $100,000. This next year, we'll be doing all the balance of the creeks in the city. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, may I ask if that 200000 will that give you enough money to survey and evaluate just between Jack Drive and Willow Creek Road? Or are you going to go above Jack Drive? Because, you know, once that water hits Jack Drive. We are going to start below Affinity RV. We're going to move all the way up to the end of the city limit lines. So, the end of the city limit lines? For Willow. Uh-huh. So We're doing it. Well, that's a long way. It is, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. But as I said, we, we put in $20,000 per mile, or $22,000 per mile, for analysis in the, in the $300,000 amount. So there's two com two parts, 300,000, 310, and 200. Well, yeah. So, yes, sir. That analysis that you do, like a backwater analysis upstream, does that also take into consideration where a culvert plugs up, like happened years ago in Crescent, where it said like a tidal wave going down? What? I tell you how we do this. FEMA doesn't care about that. They just want the standard and what's there, and we are. Our FEMA flood studies were done back in the late 70s, early 80s. They were done for, with, with contour maps of, some have said four, some have said 10. 
they uh, used, and it was, a, it was a massive program throughout the United States. And, and it was not started as a floodplain program. It was just started strictly for insurance. It, had, it, it really had no applications. But a lot of communities, that's all they had. And so they started to use it. So the engineering, the, the level of engineering was, um, I don't want to say lax, but it was as requested. Get something out, get it quick, give me people that are in the floodplain. If it's wrong, it's okay. They can come back with, with, with petitions for it. Um, so is that, did I, did I lose your question in my answer? Well, I guess what Well, we will, yeah, uh, yeah, the maintenance, that part of maintenance. Yeah, the city has a responsibility to cut trees down that we feel will plug con uh, bridges even. Because it, it, I was in a, a, a flood, uh, a hundred year flood study, or a hundred year flood plain in 1981 in Austin, Texas, and 13 people died. Um, and unfortunately, we had a plan in place to repair that channel. To, to retrofit it so it had capacity because we knew it had changed. And the citizens said, no, not in my backyard. You're not taking my property. You're not doing this. And it was so environmentally sensitive. Austin, Texas, is, is, is heartbeat is, is, uh, is environmental issues. So everything performs in that, everything proceeds in that capacity. Um, but, and, and, and then it, they had the big storm. 13 people died. And, then they said, they sued the city for not putting in the stuff, for not having the gall to make the people do it. So it's a fine line when, you're, when you work for the public because the people say, no, no, you can't do it. We love it here. The trees are beautiful. I'd like to see the trees gone. The trees are an impediment to the flow, and they create a higher elevation at that point. And if we're spending $200,000 of which a portion goes to channel improvements, I want the trees gone. I, I drive a Prius, I, I, you know, I'm the environmental coordinator, um, and so I, I, I love trees and vegetation, um, but those have, they have to be at least trimmed out and then, and, and, and perhaps up to, to get some of the vegetation. Because when you go even farther upstream past the Willow Creek restaurant, mm -hmm. there's trees everywhere in the lot, so even an old rubber yeah. car down there, uh, it's been there from probably since the 40s. And you know that trees and vegetation grow mainly where the water is, yeah. and that's where it is. And that's, that's always a continuing problem to balance out the, the, the aesthetics with the protection. And in this community, I've learned in the, the short 20 months I've been here, that the semi-arid nature of it, drainage just is sort of an afterthought only during the monsoon. And then it goes away, and nobody wants you to do anything, and there's no easements, there's no funding for it. And so it's, it's, I'm learning. I'm not complaining with that, but I'm learning. Yes, sir. Greg, how's the relationship between, you know, my county flood district levies some taxes that we all pay. Yes. What is the working relationship and how is the dynamic between you and, and the flood district? It's never been better. And I wasn't suggesting it wasn't, but is it? Um, it's, it, it has really never been better, and I'll tell you why. They never had a city drainage engineer. I'm the first one. Um, because the town grew, and, and they needed somebody that could do this. And um, Charlie Cave, who's there, uh, Jeff Lowe, who was there, he's now with us, and, and others are, are so supportive of what we're doing. They love it. They've, they've seen it needed to be done for a long time. Uh, and it's not anything I'm doing that's special. This position, with, my ex with the experience of, this posi of a person, um, would have realized the same thing. So it's, it's nothing special. It's just this has been so unattended. There's been no mandate from the citizens. There's no big floods. Nobody's got hurt. Who cares? And my feeling is that it, happened one, it happens one time, and people are going to ask, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you let us know? That's your job to do that. And, and that's why we're pursuing. We are doing everything. And the county is so supportive. Just think, we went from $100,000 for this past year, um, of which I'd only been here a few months. And now we're up to $510,000. And we developed 
what is called a CTP community something participation with FEMA. We had Ed Curtis come in from San Francisco, Maureen Town, who uh, has something to do with FEMA you know, at the state level, came, came up. I gave a presentation to them what I wanted to do. And in that meeting, he uh, offered that he would put in for another $300,000 to do the type of stuff we're doing. So they kind of delegate subsidiary to you, is what I'm saying. Yeah, oh, yes. And the county area is directing their responsibility. They're a flood control district of which we're a participant. We put in a request, and we develop, I think, the success of that, that request by establishing a good relationship, confidence in what we're trying to do, um, and, and, and just knowledge, a good knowledge base. So, uh, they know the history of it. So my anticipation is that we will get assuming the economy will allow it, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go beyond $250,000 a year for the next 10 years. And taking that money and going in all the hot spots that we learn from all the new studies we do and fixing them. And get rid of, and I know this is going to hurt a little bit, <laughs> but low water crossings. I hate low water crossings. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Okay. She had her hand. cleaning up the uh, boulders that were illegally dumped there, which could hamper the flow of Willow Creek. That area had some problems, um, and it has been filled in. It was in the county. Whether it was legal or not doesn't matter to me now. What matters is what is the impact to that area? Is everybody out of harm's way? Um, can the, the, the nature of how that water flows through, through there uh, be protected from not uh, endangering by erosion, bank erosion. erosion. Um, it was at the time, I guess, sort of on the outskirts or the limits of town to some extent, I, and I may be wrong on that because of my lack of the town, the, 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 ge the geometry or geology or whatever. The no, I understood it was dumped there a couple of years ago. Or yeah, so. yeah I, we're trying to work it. We're doing a, that. That analysis is being done right now. And they're not giving him a time limit to 
Yes, they are giving them a time limit. And I met with Nor Mark Dubroy, who's an engineer in the area, and been working with him, and I anticipate that he will be submitting his new report either the end of this week or early next week. Um, he's ready to do it. Um, I was here when it flooded, and I think other people were too, when Willow Creek flooded. And those boulders bother me. Yeah. Great. I miss a lot of what you had to say along the way, but basically what I'm hearing you say is that the city is responsible within the city limits for all the wash, um, oh goodness, <laughs> <laughs> for all of uh, the wash maintenance and remedial action. Is that correct? No, I hope I didn't leave that impression. Well, no, we're not. And, and, and here's the thing, and this is. Arizona, and, and I'm learning the state. I've been here two years now. And it's a landowner state. It, it, it's a you know stay out of my backyard government kind of thing that I've noticed. And that doesn't mean that everybody's like that and we get things. Uh, many communities I'm aware of have easements and a, we have access and we can do things as a community through the public, our, the, our, us, the, the public employees work. What I've found, and not, I'm not saying this is the case in Willow Creek, is that I'll have a drainage problem, no easement, no easement anywhere. And so what, in order to do something, I may have to have 5, 10, 20, 30 property owners agree to do something. Um, so the city will do things um, if it feels, it will first if it has rights of access, either by easement or request. If we bring to a community, you got a problem. We really can fix it for you. Um, let's say some flooding happened and it was minor, and I look, at, I look at the storm analysis, it was a small storm, and it brings up a concern. The first thing I would try to do is get with the neighborhood and say, guys, we got to do something. Uh, I need your help because I have no access rights. I haven't been in that situation yet, but I'm, I, I'm working in my brain on how I'm going to accomplish that. Um, and I had an issue just recently where somebody was having a problem in an alleyway, wasn't much water, uh, and I wanted to get our crew out there to do something. And I think the first two or three neighbors we looked at asked them, they said, yeah, go ahead. Fourth one said, get out of my yard. And, and so we were like, okay, what are we going to do? Well, I. I get concerned because I own a couple of lots that have the little tributary channels that feed into the wash uh, going behind the rear portions of those lot uh -huh. lines, which when it gets going, it rips the oh, yeah, the yeah, bank, yeah. and I often wondered why the city didn't require the developer to riprap those because it contributes to a real problem. Trees come down, block it, et cetera, the same scenario. It's not uncommon for a subdivision under the best conditions to be built and be perfect, and, and you really don't realize what's, how it's going to work, how the traffic flows, um, wh how the drainage works. Um, there are other issues, that, and they really do come alive. We, we feel like we have a real good grasp based on our experience, based on the, the technologies that, that we have um, as to what to do, but it's not 99%. Uh, it is in most cases, it has to do with structural element. We want it to be absolute. We have a lot of degrees of, of, of overkill, not overkill, but just um, making higher adjustments to make it stronger. But when a subdivision does get built, it's not uncommon for something to kind of show its face that wasn't foreseen. Um, and it may be, that may have been the case with you. I don't know. But well, I think it was pretty obvious there could be a, a big problem from anybody that had known the area at all in the history. And they just the ignored it? Ignored it, yeah. passed over it, didn't care. Right. You know, whatever. It wasn't a big issue at the time because everything was going so fast uh, as far as developments coming up. Well, give, you know, give me a call. We'll take a look at it. And what I'll look at, the kind of process I go, is that how much water do we have? What's the impact? Who's going to be hurt by this? Whose property is being hurt? And if somebody has a 300-foot deep uh, I actually had this situation. Uh, backyard, 
and there was some little erosion back in the back, and they wanted me to take care of it. I was sort of like, I don't think so, because it, it just didn't make sense. But if it's something that's of a concern, and I really get attracted to the safety of, of uh, property, human welfare, you know, all those things have to be weighed in as to what we can do. Another issue, though, in, in answer to that is that the support in the community has certain things it thinks that it has to pay for. I haven't found yet the mechanism to get the community to pay for drainage improvements other than through the flood control district. But it is not a, a, a predictable income in an amount. Um, I would obviously like to see us in a situation where we got some money that came in and then bonds could be sold and then some major projects could be put underway as opposed to trying to hit the miss, hit and miss miscellaneous project. But, you know, I work for you guys and, and if that's the way you choose to do it, then we'll make it work that way. And that's maybe I got spoiled where I was before, so we'll make it. We'll we'll make do. I haven't been here long either, like yourself, but I, I've been told that in what was the big flood in Little Creek, 1983? Yeah. That upstream, that there is, is in one of the main uh, culprits to that that caused it was that there was two levees that were that were um, some kind of reservoirs that used to be up there, and they both broke and sent a surge down Willow Creek. Is, does that ring a bell with anyone that's been around here? Are those, are those still present? Not that I know of. Does anyone know where they were? Yeah, they were up by um, uh, Kingswood. And, and so they don't exist one anymore. one dam levee that broke, and I think there was another one along the yeah, I understood there was there. two. That in fact I, I do know that there's, a, there's a lot of dam safety stuff that's come into play. Uh, because w if we have a breach in a dam, it really creates havoc. And I've had to do dam breach analysis when we reach some level of a threshold of elevation. And it's a pretty exhaustive thing. Because as you said, if something breaches like that, it, it is huge. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not only a it's a tidal wave for a short period of time. And the way they, br they breach, they breach in different ways, but they rarely just whoop, and then you got boom. What you do, you just get a lot of water that has a lot of good velocity to it, and it's unexpected, and it just exacerbates the problem if you're in a flood situation. And, and so I'm not familiar with those at all. The only things I'm aware of are the Goldwater uh, Lakes and then uh, Willow and Watson, um, and, and those are the ones that I'm, I'm looking at. So. What I understand is you had a, just a tremendous amount of, of, of rain over a short period of time. Yeah. And, and hurricanes are, hurricanes and, and frontal systems um, are, are pretty big from where I came, but I, I'm learning the monsoon. The monsoon's a different animal to me. And what you're talking about is the 1% storm, the 100 year. I was in Tucson at the time, and the uh, river in Tucson, the Santa Cruz River, was running bank to bank. They had waterfalls coming off of Hay Mountain, which is basically a cinder cone. It's dry, and you can see waterfalls coming up. There was so much water falling. And that was the same thing that happened up here. That willow. Yeah. And, and let me just share this with you. Anecdotally, when I hear about 100 or 50 year or 25 year storms, um, and not to disagree with you, but I look on the alert system that, that's on. Anybody can look at it. You can get on, go, go to the um, uh, uh, Yavapai County site, and they have a, 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 an alert system. It's called Stormwater Alert or something like that. And you can pull up rain gauges and stream gauges. It'll tell you how much water is actually falling within a very controlled containment uh, system. And I have had people tell me, let's see, the other day I was told we had a 25-year storm two years ago, two months ago, two weeks ago, I'm sorry. And when I looked at the numbers and where the rain gauges were, which you find them in proximity to where the complaint was made, 
we had a six-month storm. And, and I, just, I don't know how it happens. And I know people throughout the community have the rain gauges. Problem with the rain gauges is if you don't look at them in 24 hours, it'll say two inches. Well, you may have gotten a tenth of an inch here and a tenth there. And what we look at, and it's critical, is to look at the timing. You've got to have that water, that, 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 that rainfall, over a certain period of time. It's a concentrated, constant. Sometimes you'll have little peaks in there. And unless you have that, you really don't have the big storms. So I would be suspect if somebody said you had a 25-year storm. And do not believe the news. They, they do the same thing. They want to heighten it. So yes, ma'am. Did you say a, a couple of minutes ago that you don't care for low water crossings? I, yes, I, I, I think I emphasize that. <laughs> what would you like to see in place of our low water crossing? I don't look at your low water crossing as one that I don't like. Um, I, I see it as one that doesn't provide the safety that you need to have. Even with all the protections in place, people die at low water crossings or bridge crossings or roadway crossings <clears throat> more than any other way. How specifically is it lacking? Well, it doesn't bring you elevation above the floodplain so that the passing motorist can go there. And the low water crossing you have, generally they're, they're, they're designed for the 100 year. Yours is designed for the any year. And, and cars will float or lose control very quickly. And once you get a water into water that has any depth and velocity, the chances of survival are very, very limited. Do what? And that's a problem too, because if you've been in a flood or in a rain, you can't, you cannot distinguish between where the road and the water is ponding. It is raining. Everything has the same color. I have watched cars just motoring along at 30 miles an hour, handling the rain, doing just fine. The street. It's the same color, of where, and this was in an underpass. It's the same color as what's there. The reflection of the underpass was there, if they could see one, and they just drove right into it. And, and, and I've seen it. I've seen uh, not that just that particular ones, but our visibility, regardless of how many storm or, or elevation things we have up there, people can't see them. Their windshield wipers are going like this, and they just can't focus on what's going on. Um, I know a little bit about the story behind that, um, and whether it was economically driven or just felt like, well, this is, this is okay for the semi-arid area that we live in. The drain I'm working on a new drainage criteria manual, I've, and that is a manual that goes out to all the engineers, the developers get them, and it, it dictates what engineering design elements they're going to be using. It's nothing I've created brand new. I've taken from different places. I did the same thing when I was in Austin, Texas. And I can guarantee you no low water crossings will be approved through that new criteria manual. And it's just an evolution of this community, too. There are others that, that are here. So there was an acceptance, sec, acceptance and a tolerance with that because of alternate routes and things like that. Um, but I, I do not believe in them. I'll fight for, against having them included. I may get overruled. So we'll see. But they are dangerous. They're very dangerous. Yes, sir. Um, I represent the emergency services at the Red Cross here in the city. And I'd like to know what the possibility of endangerment to the community on a serious monsoon event. What is the endangerment? What is the what is the possibility of endangerment in this whole area for uh, in a, during a serious, serious monsoon season? in terms of high water, et cetera, et cetera? Well, the only way I can answer that is that any uh, day you have uh, any, any storm, it, you have a 1% chance of having a 100-year storm. And um, I feel that I sh we should be targeting communities in the fire station, and, and yourself may have already done that mm -hmm. through the history of what's going on, to have evacuation or, or at least notification um, storms coming, 
which is another difficult thing too to do in this community because your storms just don't have this nice, nice pattern. They break up, they'll split, you think they're coming right at you and all of a sudden they're off to the right. And you're like, what happened to them? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't experienced a hurricane system that's come in uh, inland and made it this far and settled in here. We've got a lot of, ex uh, a, a huge storm cell uh, with a lot of constant rain. I haven't seen that. Um, but I, I think I'm answering your question here that um, w we need to be able to get to those people. They need to be notified. And we need, you know, we need to, and I, I don't know what the system's set up. I don't know what the fire department's doing. I don't know what Red Cross is doing as far as providing shelters for people that are in, in harm's way or homes are in danger, need a place to stay. I know the fire department. I don't know. I, th I saw that there was some discussion with them being here. Um, I will move uh, forward with that and get somebody. If you'd like to be a part of that. We, we have plans for that. Okay, you have that yeah. set up. Okay. And what I would do is get involved through the, the alert system and then also with you guys from my position, if you'd like, I offer myself for that, to assist. If you have a war room and you know there's a big uh, uh, storm coming, and, and I think a lot of communities have that. Do we have that where everybody gathers in one place? Well, there's an EOC at the, at the airport, and we have, we have various areas to do that, in, correct. Okay. Is it, is it pretty uh, structured? It's pretty wired. Everybody in. knows who knows where to come yes, in? Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and I plan to try to be a part of that. Somebody needs to, and what we do is you can track a storm, uh, you have a rainfall gauge, you have a projection of how much that rainfall result in flow in the channel, and that gives you a little bit of lead time, uh, or, or at least tells the, the fire department, get out of there, get over here, get those people out, because we have 10 minutes, and that's a lot of time. You get in there, tell people, get out, water's rising. It's a smaller community, so the, 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 uh, the area itself is smaller, so we have less reacting time. Um, but I'd like to get something like that into the plan to where we can actually project out. And I think they may even have that, I just haven't found it. With those stream gauges, you backtrack into the rain gauges. That gives you an idea of storm cell size and distribution and intensity, but we would then have created a chart to see what that relates to. And, and I'd like to have that in place. But I haven't, I haven't even pursued that right now. Nick D'Angelo's uh, emergency service can help you on that. Who's that? Nick D'Angelo, he is in emergency services. Okay. He works with the county and the city in connection with all the necessary evacuation procedures that are being taken place in yeah. this area. And I'm not in charge of that. I just want to understand it and know it. and you know, help in any way that I can, so. All set? I appreciate your time. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Um, the board, we appreciate what you're doing, not only as a board member, but as a, in the community. Um, we're, we're proactive and we're happy, we're happy to see somebody that's proactive because it seems like it is an afterthought drainage around here and because uh, I'm from the East Coast and the view is totally different. Right. But um, anything we could do that we could work together with you. I, yeah, I'm here. I, I've told John, I told you guys earlier, I work for you. I'm at your disposal. Okay? okay? Thanks. Actually, if you just, uh, I think that's you. How does that work? <laughs> Oh, you're the engineer. I got it. I did. Yeah, so yeah. Is that still on? Uh, actually, I think what Greg said is that he, uh, he saw me as his customer, which I thought was very refreshing, and that's obviously uh, the case from the presentation. So, Greg, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I just want to give you a quick down dump of information. In local uh, issues, uh, it's very easy to have your own facts as opposed to your own opinions. So what I'm going to try and give you is some facts because you've brought out some issues that um, we've done some research on. I'm just going to do this very quickly because some, we, we, we're probably running short of time. Um, the discovery process that I got asked to do, uh, I'm a little bit forensic as people know because that's my professional background. I actually spent my career working in infrastructure finance. And some of the issues that Greg's raising, frankly, reflect with the fact the country's just spent money on stuff other than infrastructure for the last 30 years. But, you know, you've heard that from Obama as part of the election campaign. 
So what we did was um, went about looking at uh, all the city of Prescott record searches. Uh, Liz Burke, the Prescott city clerk, um, there's some press about public records that you may see from time to time. She did a fantastic job. Um, we had to get some help from the Arizona Ombudsman, but it, it, it worked out fine. We went to the ADQ records in Phoenix, Yavapai County Flood District. We even went to FEMA, Oakland and Washington. Ed Curtis in, in Oakland, once I struck up a dialogue before Frankie Craig, uh, Greg was released to talk to us by the city attorney's office. Um, you've heard a lot about FEMA. I can tell you I had a three-hour conversation with him and it was very encouraging. I mean, they just, they're on the case and that's very comforting. Um, court records, um, one of the problems we have is that, uh, well, Homeco was our previous management company and Myers and Chamber, the developer in line, they had no records. Uh, we were somewhat handicapped by the fact that the Department of Real Estate, the subdivision records for our subdivision had somehow gone missing. Um, so we didn't get anything from the developers, no subdivision files. Um, the 36-inch uh, pipeline uh, you've heard about is a very high-pressure pipeline. And you know what fire hoses do when they come loose. And so we were very keen to find out what was going on with that in our wash. Um, we actually ended up getting these from ADEQ and ended up supplying them to the city because the city didn't have them. Um, Lorraine Drive, which I think for the city, in fairness, has been, I'll say this myself, I, I think it's probably been its worst nightmare for the last 20 or 30 years since the last accident. There's no records on that because it was put there um, well before the, the uh, Lorraine Drive was even in the city. So that's kind of like a blank hole there. Um, when it rains in Prescott, watch out is the theme of this <laughs> and a question of priorities. Um, two drownings in 1980 in the center of Prescott. Uh, this actually was where two, two guys decided to drive around the barricades, which were up, so there was no lawsuit on that one. Um, this, is not a, this is not a good story for the city. Um, I remember telling Rody Simmons when he asked me how I liked living in Prescott, and I said it's been great. I've only had pleasant surprises since I've lived here. This was a very unpleasant surprise. This was a terrible story where a young girl drowned in a, in a wash late at night. Um, the family sued the city for wrongful death. Huge trial. Um, the attorney that handled this case, I've actually spoken to him, I think he thinks of it as, as his Aaron Brockovich case. The city denied all liability. It went to a jury, took three and a half weeks. The prosecution rested. They came back after lunch and the city caved because the insurance company had told them, not, told them that they, they had to. Um, and the city settled. The end result of that was that the Hale family, who actually didn't um, do this for anything other than getting the city to, to, to behave differently, the city was required to publish wash safety procedures, which and now the procedures that govern how the washes in, in, the, in the city are, are actually closed when, as, as Greg was explaining, there's an imminent danger from water. Um, this was not a good case for, for Prescott. In fact, I had one of the other board members come down because I, I felt um, they ought to read the deposition of the father of the young girl here just to kind of see what had gone before us. There's the settlement. City are hereby expressly admits negligence. It took them three and a half weeks before a jury to do that. Prior to that, they just said, we're not liable. There's the very steps they took with regards to that drowning. Actually, what happened is it, um, the jury was uh, deliberating or close to when, uh, actually never got to the jury, but this was a 1982 drowning. And of course, a year later was when the trial took place and that's when 83 um, in the crossings happened. But flooding's still an issue. Um, I don't know if anybody here is from San Dretto, but those, those people in San Dretto, I've, I've been through, I don't know, maybe 60 or 70 boxes of public records in public works. Um, the saga that these people went through in San Dretto was amazing. I, I, I had no idea of, of the issues that they'd had, which was eventually um, supposed to be fixed by a, uh, an intergovernmental agreement between the uh, city and, and the Yavapai Flood District at that time, but <clears throat> I'm not sure everybody feels those issues have been properly dealt with. Uh, the Lincoln Street Low Water Crossing, um, this was another long saga which went on, and the city, um, I can give you copies of this, I won't make you read the detail, but basically what the city is saying there is, 
you know, they'd rather go with a low water crossing than spend money on a um, on the proper bridge. And, and that's the that's the low water crossing that's down, you know, by the Grove area that's um, quite well known. Again, but, I mean. Greg made the point, I think, ultimately everything comes down to money and priorities, and this was a clear case where um, the cheapest way possible was, was deemed to be the priority. Um, flooding risk in the area. These are actually emails that we obtained by record searches. You can see that at the time, as, as Greg mentioned, the city was relying upon the uh, county flood district. Um, the city can't say that they were not told that the crossings when it was going through the development phase was, was something to be really concerned about. And in fairness, they did put in, you know, BFEs and, and uh, elevation certificate requirements, which some of us have. But I think that kind of says it all. This area was hit pretty hard in the flood of 1983. Just so you've, you've heard about the pipelines, uh, just so you know, not everybody knows this, this is the root of all the city's pipelines that cross our wash. And this is the area here. This is Robin Drive here. This is Lorraine Drive here. These are where the pipelines come through, and that's basically every single drop of the city's drinking water. John, I have a quick question. On Lorraine Drive, that's got that pump that you pass over from Robin Drive. Is that also part of some type of con containment easement or? That's a good question. I don't know. I think it's, it's here is where you're referring to. I don't know is the honest answer. I, I've assumed so, but uh, I really don't know. Where the blocking of the wash that took place is here, because you can see what happens. The, the pipelines cross the wash. These were the pipelines that my wife walking the dogs one day discovered were above ground. And so this was... The, the piece of the city's pipelines that the uh, city was was attempting to to hold down, and of course that's that's how the wash was was blocked. I think I've covered most of that. That's, that's basically saying the city's the city's uh, pipelines were above ground. What happened is we had some, and this wasn't in the monsoon season actually. Um, this was in January. This is, this is January 27th, and I think, Celeste, you took this photograph, didn't you, Celeste? This is actually taken from, <laughs> it's a pretty formidable flow of water, and that's not, even, that's not monsoon, that's just snowmelt coming down from Granite Mountain. And what I've shown on here, this is Jan 27th, 2008, and this is the flood that caused the scouring, that caused the pipelines to be exposed. So in the photograph you'll see later that comes after this, the city came in to protect the water pipelines, and its bulldozers were just here, as you'll see later. The berm that they constructed that crossed over the wash that, that Greg referred to, which has now been, um, I'll show you the photographs as how that's been dealt with, it, it came out to here. And then the reference point is this, I've called it a sewer lift location, but I'm, I'm not sure it actually is a sewer lift location. But the photograph I'm going to show you next, that's where those, that's where the next photograph, the bulldozers and, and stuff would be if they'd been doing it three days previously. So that's the work that's taking place. Um, the, the pipes were discovered uh, above ground about 10 o'clock. The city was in by about 11 o'clock and, you know, what they've clearly done is they've come across and they've, they've put this berm in to protect the pipelines. This is the route here of where the, the pipelines come across. And as you can see, what's happening here is effectively it substantially dams the wash. John, again, if I'm new here, um, I have noticed that there is, yes, there's the monsoon, but the winter rains can be, well, not only heavy, but more consistent. Oh, yeah. Rain. Yeah, it's a myth. I, I think it's a myth. Well, it's not a myth. We do get monsoon rains, but this is January. This is snow melts. The monsoon rains seem to be uh, more intense, but the, the, the winter rains, the first winter I was here, it rained a long time. Oh, yeah, we had, the wash was closed for six weeks, I think, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, right. And, of course, that, that's, uh, that's an ice risk as well. Is that an anomaly for that year? That's pretty standard, isn't it? <coughs> well, I've only been here two years, so... Yeah, 
we weren't even close to that this year. So. Yeah. We just had the one big, huge snowfall period. So this is a photograph that I took in May quite recently. And what I've done is it's not that easy to see with the lights on, but you can see the profile of what I perceive to be the wash before the damming effect took place. And actually this, this was not done by the city, was it, was it, Greg? We didn't talk about that. We can maybe that's the piece on the other side that's still there. That's we actually don't know who did Well, we don't know who did this, do we? Yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. This was this. This was the city. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know that we know who did this. We don't, but we're going to get it moved. Well, it, it juts out into here. Oh yeah. It's just not right. If they tried to create a pad, it would be the floodplain. I I assume the city did that, but I was wrong. I was wrong. Was, I was wrong. It was there when you moved in, John, wasn't it? Okay, they just got to replace the tape. That'll take a. John, that was there when you moved in. Which which was? The part that you're talking about. This here? Yeah, it was already there, wasn't it? I don't think so. No. This this armor this armoring here that's along the bottom of the wash was here when we moved in. But you know this kind of started appearing about a year ago. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look. There's no vegetation. No, it's just it's just rock. I asked the property owner here if, 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 if by email, and they've not responded, um, Dan Olivas, what the story was here, and I, I never got an answer back, so. All right? Senator Collins, thanks for coming in. It's a great pleasure, thank you. This ship that was involved in the incident off Western Australia this week... Yeah, the one the front it, fell off? Yeah. Yeah, that's not very typical. I'd like to make that point. Well, how is it untypical? Well, there are a lot of these ships going around the world all the time, and very seldom does anything like this happen. I just don't want people... Yeah, the ones the front doesn't fall off. Well, if this wasn't safe, why did it have 80,000 tonnes of oil on it? I'm not saying it wasn't safe. It's just perhaps not quite as safe as some of the other ones. Why? Well, some of them are built so the front doesn't fall off at all. Well, wasn't this built so the front wouldn't fall off? Well, obviously not. How do you know? Well, because the front fell off and 20,000 tonnes of crude oil spilled into the sea caught fire. It's a bit of a giveaway. I'd just like to make the point that that is not normal. Well, what sort of standards are these uh, oil tankers built to? Oh, very rigorous maritime engineering standards. What sort of thing? Well, the front's not supposed to fall off for a start. And what other things? Well, there are uh, regulations governing the uh, materials that they can be made of. What materials? Well, cardboard's out. And? No cardboard derivatives. Like paper? No paper. No string, no sellotape. Rubber? No, rubber's out. Um, they've got to have a steering wheel. There's a minimum crew requirement. What's the minimum crew? Oh, one, I suppose. So the allegations that they're just designed to carry as much oil as possible, uh, oh, the consequences, I mean, that's ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. These are very, very strong vessels. So what happened in this case? Well, the front fell off in this case by all means, but it's very unusual. But Senator Collins, why did the front book fall off? Well, a wave hit it. A wave hit it? A wave hit the ship. Is that unusual? Oh, yeah. At sea? Chance for millions. So what do you do to protect the environment in cases well, like this? Well, the ship was towed outside the environment. Into another environment? No, no, no. It's been towed beyond the environment. It's yes, not in the environment. A, no, but from one environment to another environment. No, it's beyond the environment. It's not in an environment. It well, has been be towed somewhere. beyond the environment. Well, what's out there? Nothing's out there. Well, there must be something there. There is nothing out there. All there is is sea and birds and fish. And? And 20,000 tonnes of crude oil. And what else? And a fire. And anything else? And the part of the ship that the front fell off. But there's nothing else out there. Senator Collins, thanks for joining us. Complete void. Yeah. We're out of time. Environment's perfectly safe. We're out of time.